Okay, as Kimberly mentioned, uh, my name is India Sowers-Page. I am currently the pre-law advisor at the University of Georgia, formerly the Outreach and Research Services Librarian. I decided to take a little detour from librarianship and to explore my interests in student services, but I'd, I will always be a librarian at heart. Um, and um, and there's, there's no saying that I won't return to, to librarianship, actually. But I just wanted to um, update you all on that since that was a recent change that actually happened uh, within the last two weeks. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to present uh, on this topic. It's a topic I'm very passionate about. So thank you so much to Kimberly Brown Harden for coordinating this webinar and to the entire Indiana State Library Professional Development Office. So my goals for this presentation are to define um, the word microaggressions. We hear that, that word being thrown around a lot in, in higher education and in librarianship, but I hope that by the end of this presentation you have a clear understanding of what microaggressions um, means, the history of the term. We'll also talk about some of the different categories of microaggressions. And then we'll end the presentation by talking about strategies for preventing them in the workplace. So just a little bit of history on the term. The, the word microaggressions was actually coined by Dr. Chester M. Pierce. He was a Harvard professor and psychiatrist. And when this word was, uh, when he started to use this word in the 70s, he coined it specifically to, to describe the insults witnessed, uh, that he witnessed, non-black Americans inflict on African Americans. Dr. Pierce um, actually passed away in 2016. He um, led a, a really interesting life. And, you know, he was really interested in the way that these subtle racial put downs actually can degrade your physical health over a lifetime. So very interesting person um, to read about or research about if you'd like to, more, to know more about his life. So that's the origin of the term. Um, the majority of the definitions that you'll see in this webinar actually come from uh, Dr. Daryl Wing Sue's work. Dr. Sue, he is a professor, a professor at Columbia University. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work. Here are two of his most popular titles, Microaggressions and Marginality. Manifestation, Dynamics, and Impact, and also Microaggressions in Everyday Life, Race, Gender, and Sexual Orientation. He has a couple of other books, um, one on counseling, the culturally diverse, uh, several books on theory and practice. So definitely some titles to consider having in your collections and also for um, your own personal study. So Dr. Sue defines microaggressions as the everyday verbal, nonverbal and environmental slights, snubs, or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalized group membership. So let's just break this down element by element. I, I'm, uh, a, the lawyer in me always likes to, to break definitions down piece by piece. So the first part of defining microaggressions, according to Dr. Sue, is that these are everyday occurrences. They're common, subtle. A lot of times um, the offense is, is just below the surface. And this is um, important to note for reasons that we'll discuss later in the presentation, uh, particularly related to tips for managers and accepting that these are common occurrences happening every day in our workplaces, and it's important to acknowledge this even if it's not something that you're personally experiencing every day. Uh, there's a good chance those around you are experiencing microaggressions on a regular basis. They can be verbal or nonverbal. So um, a lot of times it's easy to you know, point out a comment that someone has made, but it's a little bit more subtle if, if you witness someone you know, try to get out of your path when they see you uh, coming towards them. A, a lot of the example that is frequently used is, you know, the idea of someone clutching their purse when an African American walks by them on the street. The third element, environmental. Um, this refers to um, monuments, buildings named after slave owners. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit more about displays in libraries. We'll touch on environmental a little bit more there. Uh, slights, snubs, or insults. So microaggressions don't have to be overt. That's important to remember. They're called microaggressions because these things are um, often subtle. And intentional or unintentional. Um, just because you are unintentional in offending someone, it does not give you a free pass to do or say uh, whatever you want. Which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. And target persons based solely upon their marginalized group membership. Um, and this refers to race, religion, gender, ability, sexual orientation, mental health status. So Dr. Sue describes microaggressions as being death by a thousand cuts um, to the victim. Let's move into discussing some of the different categories of microaggressions. The first one is, um, is micro-assault, and these are intentional discriminatory actions or assaults to one's identity. Uh, these are deliberate with the intent to hurt, oppress, or discriminate. These are typically not as common, but some may argue that there has been an uptick um, since the 2016 election that we all know um, was a very divisive election. And micro assaults are often referred to as um, kind of quote unquote old fashioned raci racism. These are your racial slurs um, being denied services or opportunities based on your race, religion, sexual orientation, or outwardly displaying symbols of oppression. Micro insults are a lot more subtle and, and I would argue that this is um, micro insults and micro invalidations, which we'll discuss ne next, are more commonly seen in the workplace. A lot of times you won't um, see as many micro assaults because people are concerned with keeping their jobs. But micro insults, they're often unconscious communications that convey rudeness, insensitivity, or demean a person's heritage or identity. And a lot of times micro insults occur due to biases and, and blind spots. Um, the example on the post-it here, you don't sound black. Um, someone you know, may say that and they actually may intend it to be a compliment, but to the person hearing, you don't sound black, what does black sound like? Are you making that comment based on a stereotype of what you expect a black person to sound, sound like or um, the way you expect a person of color to speak? Micro-invalidations. So these are instances when a person's uh, thoughts or feelings or experiences are excluded or negated. So an example of a micro-invalidation would be, um, I don't see color. Well, there are people of color who would, um, would argue that if you don't see color, then you don't see them. You know, we all have our biases. We all but we all have our um, kind of our experiences that may cause us to relate more to certain groups of people. But the importance in the workplace is to be aware of the biases and not ignoring them. And that's the key to creating an inclusive work environment. OK, the messages you see on the post-its here are actually screen grabs from a website called lismicroaggressions.tumblr.com. I have the link up on the next slide, but um, these post-its were, they came from a display at a, at a recent conference where librarians were asked to write down um, some of their experiences with microaggressions in libraries. Um, you see the example here, this librarian is consistently assigned to search committees because she's the only Latina librarian. Um, the second post-it, you're only, you were only admitted to this program because of your, ra your race. Um, I've heard many librarians comment on um, how, how hurtful it was to hear some of their colleagues talk negatively about affirmative action or to make assumptions about um, why they are in the position they're in and that it was only because of their race and not um, 
their ability. Here's the link to the website I was referring to for those of you who are curious. Um, you can go on and check out the different postings that librarians have contributed. And this website describes itself as a space for those working in libraries, archives, and information fields to share their experiences with microaggressions. OK, let's talk about a couple of more examples. You speak good English. You people. That's so gay. There's only one race, the human race. I'm not racist. I have several Mexican friends. Everyone can succeed in America if they work hard enough. That's crazy. Who is the man or woman in the relationship? That last one, a lot of times, being a comment that um, people are are ask of members of the LGBTQ community. Um, I, I do want to highlight the phrase, that's crazy. Um, a lot of times we throw around that phrase or say something is insane without thinking about uh, how that kind of language could affect the colleagues among us who are struggling with mental health challenges. So I just I point out these different examples because language matters um, as professionals, as librarians. We want to be mindful um, of the words that we use in the workplace. Environmental microaggressions. These are um, some of the examples you see with protests of mascots, street buildings, um, rather street names, building names, and different monuments. So when experiencing microaggressions, it's, it's common that uh, the person on the receiving end of a comment begin to have an internal dialogue. A, a lot of times, you know, you're debating, should I say something? What do they mean by that? I don't want to come across as being too sensitive. Will speaking up make it worse? Um, did I interpret that correctly? These are all um, common thoughts that run through your mind when encountering a microaggression. And, it's very uh, common to have a fear of speaking up because you don't want to make the situation worse or be perceived as the angry person in your workplace. And so that internal dialogue a lot of times will leave you to wonder, am I overreacting? My answer to that is a resounding no. Your feelings are real, they're legitimate, and they matter. There have been so many studies shown, um, or so many studies that have researched the, the lasting impact of microaggressions. Dr. Uh, Sue talked about, in, in some of his work, anxiety, decreased productivity and confidence, depression, insomnia, loss of drive. Um, all of these things can result um, from being in a, in a hostile work environment or consistently experiencing microaggressions over and over and over again. That's that death by a thousand cuts. So what do we do about it? If you're a manager, you're in a, in a great position to foster the kind of work environment that makes conversations about uh, microaggressions make to make sure your employees are more comfortable um, bringing these situations to you. So as a manager, it's most important to model the kind of um, behavior that you want to see, to accept the microaggressions they're happening in your workplace, even if they are not specifically happening to you. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than having a manager who um, anytime an employee is courageous enough to bring an issue up, you question whether there's really an issue at all. So it's very important as a manager to um, be open to hearing your employees, whether it's an issue that you have directly experienced or not. Acknowledging the, the occurrence is extremely important. And, and that's whether you committed the microaggression yourself or uh, whether you witnessed a microaggression. Uh, we all make mistakes. You know, we 
we have all said things and um, we maybe wondered if, if we should have said that thing. So, and it's important to acknowledge and go back, you know, if you think you did or said something that made one of your employees uncomfortable and call out inappropriate behavior. It is a huge hit to the morale of an environment when um, there's a particular person who continues to engage in inappropriate behavior and the management does absolutely nothing. Um, you will destroy the morale of the rest of your employees. And so with, with all of these points, it's important to recognize as a manager if you have certain um, kind of gaps in your ability, seek out training. Some of these conversations can be extremely difficult to have. So, you know, if your organization offers an opportunity to get more training in diversity and inclusion, um, definitely do so so that you are more comfortable um, facing microaggressions directly when they come up in the workplace. Let's talk about some of the ways we can prevent microaggressions as an employee. One of the biggest things we can do as um, librarians in libraries um, is to be consistent with enforcing library policy. Um, it, it's I can't stress enough how important it is. If you if you have policies that you're enforcing inconsistently, it's easy for our patrons to assume that they're being treated in um, certain ways because of the color of their skin or because of their sexual orientation or religion. So just be sure that, uh, first off, any policies that your organization has created, um, re-examine them to make sure that there aren't any biases that have become a part of the policy. Um, and then making sure that everyone on your staff um, is consistently enforcing library policy. It's extremely important to be aware of your own biases. I'm gonna make these slides available after the presentation and you'll find that a few of the photos are linked. Um, this slide is linked to the Harvard University's, um, their implicit bias website where you can take different implicit association tests. Um, and these tests are designed to measure uh, within social psychology to detect the strength of a person's automatic association between certain representations. And so the test is designed to help you um, identify certain stereotypes. I have the website pulled up, so I'm gonna show you a few examples of the kinds of tests you can take on the site. So you see here, you can do the test on um, ageism, racism, gender science, president, skin tone, ability, um, there's an Arab Muslim IAT, Asian weapons, sexuality. I encourage you all to go on and take a few of these tests. I think you may be surprised at um, some of the results. And this is a free uh, website, so you, just, you can just log on and take the test without uh, registering for anything or having to pay to take the, the test. Okay, let's get to the third point here. It's important as librarians to defer to diversify. Oops, let's switch here. Okay, it's important uh, for librarians to diversify um, library displays and instructional materials. I think about when I was um, in elementary school and I would go to the library every week. Um, how exciting it would be for me as a young African American girl to see books um, with people who look like me. So as you're creating your displays, think about the population that you, that you serve. Do they reflect that population? If you have the opportunity to um, present workshops or webinars and you're using different hypotheticals, do you vary your names? Do you vary your photos? Um, all of these things um, are very important in creating inclusive libraries. Another thing we can do is to just be mindful of the language that we use. I pulled this photo from uh, Rutgers Tyler Clementi Center, and this center um, 
they are they exist to engage scholars and practitioners, thought leaders to examine the impact of bias and peer aggression on higher education. So you you see some of the examples here of you know the language that we use in our libraries. Um, those illegal aliens, um, that's so gay, that's so ghetto. Um, you never know who is around you, um, not only as a colleague but as a patron. This this language should not, I would argue the language shouldn't be used, period, just as an extension of professionalism. But think about how some of these phrases um, make assumptions that uh, about these different groups of people and how that would impact someone in the room. Say, for example, um, the someone who has an, a disability and there's a coworker who consistently uses the phrase, that's so retarded. Can you, can you imagine uh, what that would be like to to be in the room and to constantly have to hear that kind of language. I also want to mention um, the idea of the platinum rule. In cultural competency trainings, there has been a shift from, um, you know, the golden rule or you know treating others as you would wish to be treated to the platinum rule. Platinum rule, which is to treat others the way they want to be treated. You know, an example of that would be if you have a um, a trans colleague um, who has made it clear the pronouns that they would like to be referred to. Um, it's important for us to, as professionals, to treat that colleague as they wish to be treated and respect those um, pronouns, even if it's something that you personally can't relate to or understand. Okay, let's talk a little bit about confronting microaggressions head on. I first encourage you to pause before proceeding. Just take a moment, take a breath, think through before you begin the conversation, um, what do I want to gain in confronting this? Because uh, that's going to determine the way you approach the conversation. You may just want to express how you feel and move on, um, or you may want to, you know, have a a, a more in depth conversation about why that comment um, made you feel the way you felt. So just in that moment of pausing, um, take a moment to reflect on, you know, what do I hope to accomplish in this conversation? Because that'll also help you determine whether you even want to engage in the conversation, because if you do choose to engage, you have to be prepared for any response that you receive. Assume no malicious intent unless otherwise shown, um, especially for um, first offenders, I should say. Um, I always try to assume the best. I know that can be difficult, but a lot of times with microaggressions, these things can be so subtle um, that it it's usually more helpful in furthering the conversation if um, you assume that the person did not intend to harm with the comment. I wanted to, to make a, a note here about humor. A lot of people are comfortable using humor to kind of um, lighten the situation. I've always been hesitant to use humor when confronting microaggressions because I, I never want um, the person I'm talking to to make light of my feelings. But if you're a person who is comfortable using humor um, as a method of confrontation, then by all means, there's no one way to do this. It just, for me, it has not um, worked very well because I definitely don't think microaggressions are a funny uh, situation or a laughing matter. Ask follow-up questions. Um, what did you mean by that? Or what were you referring to? And explain your point of view. And also listen to uh, what the person has to say in response. A lot of times um, they are, they're surprised um, that they have caused offense. And as tempting as it may be, um, avoid the temptation to respond with sarcasm, sarcasm or to um, respond back with a microaggression or an insult. Because um, 
I found that lasting change typically comes from educating a person or, under, or truly understanding a different perspective. And so again, that's why important, it's so important at the beginning to decide what your intention is um, with initiating the conversation. If you know that you won't be able to um, talk about the incident without getting angry, then maybe that isn't the time um, being in the workplace to confront it. Maybe you just need to take a deep breath that day and walk away. So what do you do if the person, um, if they're denying being offensive? If you've gone through all the steps and they're just, you know, they say, don't be so sensitive or you're pulling the race card. Again, step back, take a deep breath, decide if you even want to continue the conversation. Have you finished what you set out to do and simply expressing how you felt about the situation? Um, but if you do decide to continue, reiterate that you're not blaming um, the person, but that you just want to make it clear how that comment made you feel and you know that you would appreciate if they not do or say that again. In all of this, you always have to be open to any kind of response. Um, and you know, I have a quote here of all strategies, knowing when to quit may be the best. Um, you may just have to walk away from the situation knowing I, I expressed how it made me feel it didn't seem to make an impact on them, but I'm okay with it. I said my piece. Um, I also share this in thinking about, you know, there may be a time when you decide um, I, I'm in a hostile work environment and it's time for me to move on. Of course, no one should be forced out of any job, but sometimes the best decision may be for you to leave um, a position. Okay, I wanted to leave plenty of time here at the end to um, kind of open it up for questions or comments. And so I will um, see if I can load the chat window so I can see some of the different things you all want to share or discuss. India, uh, we had uh, a comment earlier when you were talking um, about how the manager can um, can help with the atmosphere with microaggressions. Wendy made uh, a comment that you know sometimes the manager is the problem. How do you how would you like to speak on that or touch touch upon that? If the manager is the issue, if they're the one committing the the microaggressions. Sure. Um, if if it is the manager, of course, that, that's a very uh, tricky position to navigate. Um, document everything. I always recommend, you know, you, you keep a, a record of conversations. If you speak to them in the hall about something or in their office, when you get back to your office, you know, shoot a quick email saying, you know, just a quick description of the, the conversation. And also know when you need to kind of move it up to the next level and um, talk to someone in HR. Uh, our HR departments are, um, well, they should be trained, uh, have a lot more experience in this area and can provide you with advice on how to proceed. I know that it, this um, scenario, it can be so tricky and it varies so much depending on the structure. Um, but in my, in my experience, um, as, as challenging as it has been, I've been able to speak to the supervisor. And then if I did not feel that um, an issue would be addressed, then move it up to the HR level. All right, I'm getting trying to track your questions as they're coming in. Okay. Robert has a question. Uh, he wants to know, how is the phrase, there is only one race, the human race, considered a microaggression? A microaggression. Okay. So that phrase, I guess similar to the phrase, I don't see color. The thing you have to understand by 
even though the intent behind using those phrases um, is often a good intent, we are all different. We all have different backgrounds. Um, we all have, you know, different experiences. And for many people to to say that is to somehow because a lot of times the context the context that it's shared in is to dismiss a person's experiences. You know, so someone has an issue with a comment and then the response is, you know, I don't see race or where there should be no issue. We're all the human race. Um, so it's really about context and making sure that phrase isn't being used as a micro invalidation to dismiss a person's experiences um, and just, you know, kind of use it as a as a muzzle. I wish I could see the chat box so I can see if that sort of answers this question. He hasn't responded yet, I don't think. So it's, it's really about uh, the context. Okay. There is another question, let's see. I don't know if I touched this one or not, uh, from Susan Riley. How is microaggression different than bullying? Did I ask you that one already? Um, no. Well, okay. Microaggression, especially when you when you think about the different categories that we talked about, um, a lot of times they can be so slight and subtle that a, a lot of times when we think about bullying, it's it's a it's a lot more overt. Um, so they're kind of they're similar, but a lot of times microaggressions cause you to pause and say, you know, what what did a person mean by that? Whereas a lot of times bullying is a lot more obvious. Like, especially when you think about micro invalidations or, um, you know, micro assaults being a lot more overt, those definitely, um, it's easy to connect those more with bullying, but like your micro insults and your micro invalidations, a lot of times are so subtle that um, a lot of times people don't immediately see them as bullying. Okay, and I have a question from, let's see, Stephanie has a question. I have a question about my own biases related to my own, to my aversion to older white males who I perceive to be deeply invested in their privilege. Okay. Um, and was there another part of the question or, because I, I, I will say, I'm, I'm glad this point came up is um, a lot of times, you know, <laughs> we in no way want to make assumptions that people who belong in, to, in certain uh, marginalized groups, that they are incapable of, uh, of making um, microaggressive comments themselves. And so, you know, that's where the examination of our own biases is, is, is so important. It's not that we don't have them, but when you are more aware of them, then it allows you to um, be more uh, fair and equal in the way you interact with um, everyone in the workplace and our patrons. Emily Reed has a question. Uh, well, she's asking for any tips for dealing specifically with age-related microaggressions. It sometimes is discouraging working as a young female professional in an industry that values the opinions of older white men more than people like myself. Ageism. Well, specifically, um, we, we are in such a unique time that we have four different generations um, in the workplace. And I was actually um, recently doing a study to do, <laughs> to do a presentation on uh, diff the different generations in the workplace. So this, this question is something that's fresh on my mind. I think in creating inclusive environments and, um, and considering our management styles, it's important to, to leverage the strengths of um, each of the generations and getting projects done and getting you know meetings conducted um, successfully. So that's another area that management can um, you know do a little bit more research in 
And I, I know a lot of times some of the generalizations about each generation are negative, but there are a lot of positive things um, that each generation brings to the, the workplace and working to, you know, use everyone's strengths to the betterment of our bigger goal. I feel like that the different generations in the workplace is, is another presentation within itself. It's definitely something I've been thinking a lot about and something that I would love to continue talking to you about if you want to send me an email. I have so many thoughts that um, may venture outside of um, this uh, presentation here today. Candace has a question. Do you have any suggestions for small scale training, micro trainings? that we could do with our staff uh, in regards to this topic? What I will do is um, I'm going to make these slides available and I'll also add um, some resources at the end um, of the presentation of is the question about, you know, webinars or discussion prompts, um, kind of facilitation training, all of the above, um, because I can definitely I have a running list of some of those resources and I can make that available to anyone who's interested and just everything from um, kind of tip sheets on facilitating conversations or a lot of times referred to as courageous conversations, as well as some different online um, resources to get more information about um, microaggressions. Because there, there's so many different, you know, institutes and centers that are studying this. Okay, let's see. Going over, trying to get all these questions in. Sure. Um, I did see, see. Um, I had the window pop up and I saw someone asked um, about, you know, whether only, um, I think they said, so only older Caucasian people commit microaggressions. That That's absolutely um, not what we're saying at all. It's important for us all to um, consider our biases and, and um, avoiding um, bringing microaggressions into the workplace. It's this isn't exclusive to one group of people. Carlette Hoagland asks, "What if HR is the problem?" <laughs> oh goodness, um, that 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 is that is tricky, but that is a lot of people's reality, uh, which is why I I mentioned you know knowing when it's time to go. I know that's not always easy. I know that's not always possible for everyone. And so in situations where HR is the problem and you're not in a position to move on, um, this, the, coping the coping mechanism then becomes, you know, the things that you do in your um, everyday life and outside of work to help you to endure until you can move on or until you retire, you know, setting certain boundaries at work, um, with the conversations you choose to participate in. Um, and, and so the, that conversation then shifts to coping in a different way. Jenny Law asks, what are the best ways that I, as a white colleague, can be an ally in these situations aside from examining my own behavior? Mm -hmm. Listen, I, I can't stress enough to, to listen when um, people are sharing about their experiences. A lot of times, you know, there's a temptation there to say, you know, but not all, you know, not all men or not all white people or not all. Um, listen and, and, and believe that this, these experiences are real, that they're happening, even if they aren't happening to you every single day. Um, and another thing I always recommend is to speak up. You know, I think about an example of when um, I was working at a reference desk and um, a gentleman came in and, you know, said, I have a really tough research question. Is there a man here who can help me? You know, there was a, a male librarian nearby who, you know, kind of turned and came towards the desk and said, you know, India is, is the person who is most experienced in this area and the best person to help you here in the library. So not just, you know, standing by silently, but speaking up when you have the opportunity to speak up. Clayton Hewlett has a comment. 
He says, interesting, as an older white male, I sense ageist micro-invalidation in countless ways every day. Okay. Did he have a did he have a question or no, okay just a comment. okay and then, thank you for sharing uh, yeah Lori Durbin uh, has a question sure uh, so having a conversation with a coworker how do you say to your children that race doesn't matter and still convey that their feelings history etc are important how do we say two mommies don't matter without sounding without sounding that we think their experiences don't matter. Okay, could you repeat the second part of that question? I wanna just be, I wanna be sure I understand it. Sure, um, it says, doo -doo -doo. how do we say two how mommies do we don't say, How do we say two mommies don't matter without sounding like, without sounding that we don't think their experiences don't matter? Okay. I, I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I I think the the gist of the question is somehow balancing between um, the fact that you know we all got we're all you know part of humanity and we have these um, these common experiences. Like the balance between, I guess the phrase that was brought up earlier, we're all the human race, um, but also respecting our differences. And I think uh, since the question is specifically asked about children, you know, I feel like a lot of times children are a lot better than this <laughs> at this stuff than adults. Um, anyway, so just having honest conversation um, with your children about these different topics. I, I think about I have a lot of conversations about um, bullying with my um, nine year old niece, and she's uh, sometimes I feel like she gets this stuff a lot faster than. Um, some of the adults that I I talk with, I'm not, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I, I think that's the gist of what it was referring to. Did I lose sound here? I can hear you. Okay. Are you still sharing your screen? Um. Yes, I can stop sharing now. Let's see. And then you'll be able to see the chat. Okay. Julie, I'm just going to read some comments here until you can see. Sure. Julie mentions it's discouraging to be older and discounted immediately as being out of date when that isn't the case. Yeah, that's that's very discouraging. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I would love to, um, you know, see more conversation about um, ge the different generations in the workplace, for sure. Um, it's it's a presentation that I, you know, hope to do or to be a part of a panel on. Um, sometime in the coming months, because there there's so many conversations that can be had about um, ageism on both ends of the spectrum. And thank you, Stephanie, uh, for sharing. Uh, she says that Wichita State is doing research right now about bullying in the workplace, and she shared a link with everyone. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, for that. Okay, I, I do see a comment from Chelsea. Looks like we're okay. responding to Lori's um, question. And she said, uh, as a queer woman of color, I'm not really comfortable with children being taught that race or sexual orientation does not matter. These identities, along with others, such as gender, ability, et cetera, do matter to those of us that embody these ident identities. It may be worthwhile teaching them that some people are different than them, and that is completely fine. It's a great comment. Instead of the, using the language, um, they don't matter. Yes, I guess that, that definitely goes back to the importance of language.
did you see Marissa uh, had a question um, about what is the best way to deal with patrons who verbalize their microaggressions towards staff or to other library patrons? Okay, I think my mic's, there we go. Um, I, I, I don't have to tell you all that patrons, <laughs> patrons can, can be a little tricky at times because, um, you know, we, we may not be able to hold them to um, some of the same standards that we're able to hold our colleagues as employees of the library, but we, we can still um, enforce um, policies that support inclusive, an inclusive library. So, of course, if anyone is, is making you know, racist remarks or um, using their computers to, to pull up uh, inflammatory information, asking them to leave or warning them, depending on how um, how extreme this the incident is. Um, again, it, it just goes back to enforcement. A lot of times I've, I've found that, you know, you'll have libraries that have, you know, one person representing a particular group and that person tends to be the sole person enforcing certain things. And so just consistency in enforcing library policy is, is so key and not leaving, you know, the, the sole person of color or the sole person of uh, in a particular religious group or sexual orientation to do um, all of the enforcing and speaking up on these different topics. I see a comment that says we have more problem with political differences here. I think that that is um, with the divisiveness of the recent election, we're seeing that um, in a lot of workplaces and libraries. We got time for more questions and more comments. Um, if anyone has anything else, um, also, I did put a link um, into a survey into the chat box. Please uh, fill those out for us, and that helps us to um, get more webinars or to have more ideas about different types of webinars or to improve what we're already doing. And I apologize for the, for the horrible echo that you heard earlier. It was no fun listening to myself in my headphones either, so I, I do apologize for that. Um, but again, please make sure that you um, fill out the survey to today's webinar. And, and I just want to encourage everyone who attended, um, you know, thank you for attending. And um, this, this is a, it's a process, it's a journey um, for a lot of people to have these kinds of conversations um, because they aren't always easy conversations to have. It's not easy to confront your, your own biases. And so um, I'm, I'm excited that you're here and, um, and even wanting to, to learn about this topic and, and just continue, continue to learn, continue to talk to those around you and um, learn from the experiences of, of others. Okay. I will definitely be making my slides available since I wanna go back and add um, some more, re some of the resources I, I mentioned. Um, I I'll, I'll, will aim to have, I was going to have the slides to you all um, by the end of the day, but I may need an extra day just to go back and kind of pad it with some more resources and tip sheets. And India, thank you so much for sharing and for agreeing to do this uh, today with us. Really appreciate it. I, I, like I said, I was floored when I heard your presentation the first time. So. Thank you for uh, presenting for us today. And also before um, you head out, those of you who are leaving now, if you do need an LEU, a library education unit, please, I uh, put it up, uh, please click on it, download it, and then you will be able to uh, print it out and put your name on it. Um, this presentation is eligible for one library education unit or LEU if you do need that. So again, uh, thank you so much, India, for your time today. And it looks like I don't see any questions, just a lot of thank yous. So um, yes, India, thank you so very much.
and I will be on here for another few minutes and I think maybe India will hold on for another few minutes too in case anybody has questions. Yes, thank you so much for having me.